the image that is being shown to you right now is uh, 18,000 BC, that means about 20,000 years ago. There are images of uh, homes or buildings built in triangular forms, which are over 8,000 years, that's 6,000 BC, in places like Romania. There are skeletal images of uh, to leave your body with your legs crossed in a proper siddhasana posture. Now in Lebanon, this is a, a classic representation of Guru Puja stone. This is very important to understand that uh, <clears throat> it is in the last uh, twelve to fifteen thousand years that uh, the longing to know got organized and found an organized expression through various systems of yoga. It's uh, uh, fantastic to see that uh, this goes back right up to the time of the Adi Yogi, if we want to look for physical proof, still there's a little bit of physical proof left around the world uh, suggesting these things. I am not some kind of an archaeologist <laughs> or an expert in these matters, <coughs> but you will see some of the things that we will uh, look at today will intrigue anyone and set us thinking. We cannot call this one hundred percent proof but it suggests a few things. What is this all about? Why this has to be connected to Saptarishis? Because it's a particular way of looking at life. When I say particular way of looking at life, it is not about someone's opinion, but it is about an internal uh, reflection of the cosmos, an internal understanding of the nature of creation and a very internalized understanding of a human being and the making of a human being and every other creature on this planet. When I say internal, I am talking about uh, in contrast with uh, modern science which observes everything from outside and gone quite deep into its observation today as to how the physical creation has happened. It is in no way in contradiction with the inner way of looking, it is just that it starts at a different end. It's like if you start looking at a tree from the top, your understanding of the tree will be one way. 
if you start looking at a tree from its roots, your understanding of the tree will be completely different. Only when a meeting point happens somewhere, they look similar. Today we are coming to a place in the history of modern science and in the development of modern science where mysticism and modern science are beginning to look similar. So, this exploration today will be important in that sense and uh, as I said, uh <coughs> It is… this is not an archaeology lesson for you, but uh, it's just to show you that there have been many suggestions to show that uh, the origin of this is Adiyogi and from him how it could have reached various places. Within myself, I know it did, but uh, you don't have to go by my <laughs> experience of life because somebody else's experience uh, can never be yours. But here is a little bit of physical proof going around. This whole uh, process of Adiyogi and transmission of this way of knowing started in the region that today we refer to as Manasarovar and Kailash. And uh, from there it spread to places in different spaces they went. There are many references to the seven sages, particularly in uh, Central Asia, Turkey, Romania, uh, as far as uh, Northern Africa, Arabia, there are continuous references to seven sages in the tradition, even today uh, it is. And uh, you will see uh, in Arabia, in places like Lebanon, uh, Egypt, mm, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Sudan, in all these places, even today uh, popular restaurants are named as Seven Sages. <laughs> so that is how much prevalent it is even today. When you ask these people who the Seven Sages are, nobody knows who the Seven Sages are in the common uh, knowledge of the people. But from generation to generation for thousands of years, the idea of Seven Sages coming from the East uh, seven wise men coming from the east is uh, still very much prevalent in most of the cultures out there. For example, uh, you will see the images of uh, snake worship going back right up to 18,000 BC in places like Siberia and uh, Central Asia. These are very uh, rudimentary images, you must understand, because they are so rudimentary, not because uh, the people who made these things were rudimentary in their mind, but because the tools available to do this was rudimentary. Uh, nobody can ever dig up the whole planet to find out if there are more sophisticated expressions of this. Uh, it is just that uh, when you spread a message, just uh, everybody may start doing things. The image that is being shown to you right now is uh, 18,000 BC, that means about 20,000 years ago. The approximate date that we established for Adiyogi's uh, uh, presence in this region is somewhere between 40 to 60,000 years ago. Uh, you might have heard that many times I've been saying it is 15,000 years ago, because for 15,000 years we have solid physical proof iconographic proof which is over twelve thousand years old. Because of that, we have been saying fifteen thousand, but uh, when I have spoken long time ago, uh, ten, twelve years ago, I've always spoken in terms of forty to sixty thousand years ago, because in the yogic culture, that is how it is seen. But today, without a proof, if you say something, it will become meaningless in the world. Because of that, we have brought down the date to twelve to fifteen thousand years. Here is a eighteen thousand BC, which is twenty thousand years ago. They made calendars, which is purely the yogic form of calendar. You will see in India any number of pictures like this. Here is this uh, third image, uh, or the first image which is made into a diagram in the third phase, is uh, three sets of spirals. The central set of spirals, and the lower set together represents uh, the solar cycle 
calendar which is three have three hundred and sixty four days, which is the year that we follow even today. And uh, the upper set refers to three hundred and fifty four days, which is the lunar cycle uh, of the calendar, which is what the Hindu calendar follow follows even today. And a combination of these two, which is today being referred to as lunisolar calendar, this is twenty thousand years old. And somebody cannot arrive at this without an inner perspective. Just by observation of the outside, one cannot arrive at a calendar like this, which is… this is a very sophisticated manifestation of the calendar. If you… if uh, this is written in braille, <laughs> even if a blind person puts his hands around, he will know which day, uh, which day of the year it is, which day of the month it is, and uh, which face of the moon it is, all these things can be found out just by touching the rock or looking at it. And along with that comes snake worship, which is the three snakes going up. This is a representation of uh, Ida, Pingala and Shushumna, the three channels within the body. So this is a very yogic expression, India is full of these kind of images. This was found in Siberia, uh, which is dated as 18,000 BC right now by the archaeologists. There are images of uh, homes or buildings built in triangular forms, which are over 8,000 years, that's 6,000 BC, in places like Romania. Eastern Europe and Central Asia is full of s these kind of possibilities. If you look at the geometric uh, perfection of how it is done, this is the basic form of yantra. Triangular block in Isha Yoga Center <laughs> is built exactly like this. Unfortunately, we are not 8000 BC, we are now <laughs> we built this only about twenty-two years ago. And uh, they built a, a perfect yantra-shaped building for whatever purposes that they were doing this. Obviously, these are al aligned properly to the eastern uh, direction. And these directions are adjusted to either equinox or solstice usually. Our own buildings like Dhyana Linga and uh, Triangular Block, are adjusted to the equinox because equ equinox is significant for me in my perception of life. Uh, that is, 23rd of September is a equinox and uh, because my understanding of everything comes from the equinox, I adjusted it to the equinoxes, some of them adjusted to the solstice. For the Saptarishis, uh, solstice must have been definitely be a most important aspect of their life because it is on that day for them, Adiyogi opened up the doors for them. So if you go on like this, there are any number of uh, possibilities. Uh, as we go further to Turkey, to uh, further down to Mesopotamian region, Greece, Crete, further down to uh, places like uh, Lebanon and uh, North Africa, you will see geographically every place has something to say where the influence is yogic in its nature and uh, a whole lot of them uh, going back, way back to like twelve thousand, thirteen thousand years. For example, uh, we can see here in Turkey, which is dated as ten thousand BC. This is a, a very typically Indian image in the terms of a linga or a head with a snake climbing on it because this is the yogic symbolism of uh, a human being's inner potential being aroused. Uh, or it is the symbolism of Kundalini. Similar images are found as far as South America, in Peru, in uh, Ecuador, in, in that region. One must understand, most of these things have been either destroyed by age, 
and uh, the natural processes that happen on the earth in terms of uh, uh, earthquakes and other events that happened. At the same time, they've also been systematically destroyed by certain forces in the last, uh, uh, you know, two thousand years or so. Systematic destruction of anything which was considered pagan happened in many areas and either buried or broken or destroyed or used as material to build other buildings that they wish to build. In spite of that, there is substantial uh, evidence spreading across the planet showing uh, that um, the influence of the seven sages, the yogic culture and uh, the science of yoga manifesting itself in so many ways. We must understand the proof uh, that we are talking about according to today's uh, archaeological substance is only the physical proof. Today, uh, you are doing yoga in United States. Suppose a thousand years later, somebody wants to find out how, how will they find yoga in you <laughs> So, there will be no proof in your home, there will be no proof anywhere that you are practicing yoga in your life. So it is only when we manifest something uh, which is physical, which is uh, made in such a way that it will last forever, only then we can talk about it. But even for this, we can show, we can see that thousands of years ago, people practicing yoga, they lived and died in yogic postures. There are skeletal images of uh, people sitting in… see, that could be you. Uh, when you were doing your Shambhavi Mahamudra, you happened to die <laughs> Or you uh, attain enlightenment and you… you are conscious enough to leave your body with your legs crossed in a proper siddhasana posture. See, here somebody died doing Shambhavi or they died in a siddhasana posture <laughs> some eight thousand years ago in Romania. And uh, if this one person did this, uh, I am sure this is not the only person who did this. It, there must have been a whole culture of uh, this dimension. And there are any number of images showing people sitting uh, in yogic postures. This is usually the representation of Pashupati as one dimension of Adiyogi, that is, he is the Pashupati. They called him Pashupati because uh, all the life forms are claimed to a certain genealogy and because he exhibited or he demonstrated how everything comes from the same source and that source is nothingness and uh, he is a representation of that. Because of that he was called as Pashupati and also because uh, when he <coughs> When he sat in certain states, it is… Uh, it is something that people have witnessed that all kinds of creatures gathered around him. Because all of them gathered around him, people saw him as the lord of uh, all creatures and he is the Pashupati. This is a representation of that. A repetition of these images across the planet in various forms and in various… Uh, different manifestations of art has uh, found expression in cave arts going as far back as uh, eight, ten thousand years. And uh, when I say uh, cave paintings and arts, you must understand, today your child is drawing something in your house and sticks it on the wall. And uh, if somebody finds it ten, fifteen thousand years later, the chances of finding it, how remote it is, that is how remote it is for us to find those things. They might have done a million artworks, we may find one or we may not. So, in spite of that, so much has been found. We can go on like this uh, in various uh, places, all these manifestations, but the more recent ones uh, would be a certain uh, tribe of people who identified themselves as Minoans is called the Minoan culture or they were also called as Manus in Germany and in German language the word Manus means the first man. 
which has been the essential uh, representation in India, Manu is referred to as the first man uh, or uh, the man. Manu is not a person, Manu is the man, like, uh, like people refer to Adam in the West. Manu is uh, a man or the origin of the man. When we say a man, that does not exclude a woman, we are talking, we are referring to a human being as a man. It is somewhere down the line that the usage became like this, uh, when societies became more and more uh, patriarchal and man-oriented. The, the word that was used to describe a human being started describing only a man and they had to find another word to describe the female of the species. In uh, Minos, uh, in Crete, which is a, a Greek island today, and Manu in India, uh, in many ways, go parallel in their descriptions and the way things are described. The manifestation, the now that we are looking at uh, these Saptarishis as being uh, the transmitters of uh, Adi Yogi's teaching, naturally wherever they went, the representation of the snake, the bull and the form of the linga manifested itself. You will see in places like Ireland, in very strong representation of the linga worship. The people in Brittany, when I say Brittany, in France, uh, are a region which is called Brittany and uh, when I happened to be in Brittany, they were very excited and they took me to a temple which is uh, supposed to be six thousand years old where they were still worshipping the four elements and they said, we came from northern Gangetic plain and uh, it is our brothers who went to the island, which today is known as Britain. He said, this is real Brittany <laughs> So this goes on endlessly, there's a whole lot of pictures uh, we could uh, show you and there's a whole lot of material which may be a little too much for you to digest uh, in this little time that we have. But we will just run through these pictures uh, for you to just see, for yourself to make out, I will not really say much about it, but just look through this, just see how uh, intriguing and wonderful it is that uh, going way back, the oldest picture that we have is uh, dated as twenty thousand years ago. Here is Ireland, you see this snake symbolism. Mm, which is typically, typically yogic. And uh, here is the worship of Linga. And the three, uh, this uh, spiral which is the cosmic uh, representation or it is the manifestation of what we call as the saligram. The inside of the saligram is make, made like this. This is uh, uh, the, the image of the Anunite is used as saligram because that is the representation, the yogic representation of the cosmic uh, galaxies. This is uh, 2000 BC. These spirals, uh, this has been one of our thing to build an underground spiral like this in the Indian Yoga Center, we've still not managed to do this. as a process of meditation to go through the spiral. If you go through a dark spiral like this, if at the end of it you will naturally become meditative. We've been wanting to build a proper spiral, a geometrically correct spiral, which uh, only that bottom corner one is the right one, but uh, we are yet to do it. Here is uh, Zeus uh, worshipped as a serpent. The serpent worship uh, is very deep-rooted in, uh, in every culture on the planet. Uh, of course, you must have seen the Naga temple in the yoga center. This is the image that we have today in the yoga center, but uh, somewhere around 700 BC, a Jewish king uh, ordered that all snake temples must be destroyed because uh, for whatever his own reasons. So systematically these things were broken in that region 
Otherwise, the whole of Arabia, Eastern Europe, uh, Northern Africa, South America were full of snake worship and temples were snake worship. Wherever uh, anybody connected with Adi Yogi goes, uh, naturally the manifestation of snake and snake worship would be there. Even today, the modern uh, medical sciences using spiral snakes, Mesopotamia, you see many images of this. Uh, you must see this in Turkey and Iraq region, there are plenty of uh, broken uh, <laughs> parts of uh, snake worship. The symbol of commerce even today is a spiral snake with seven meeting places. The symbol of uh, health is uh, three and a half uh, spirals of the snake which is uh, something that we are using in so many ways. Dhyana Linga is seven-pointed uh, spiral and uh, Devi Bhairavi is a three-and-a-half spiral. This is how these images are made. This is a physical representation, this could be manifested in so many different uh, ways. This is common knowledge, uh, biblical knowledge that uh, Moses uh, used a copper snake or a brass snake to cure people of various things. And uh, this snake worship continued. At some point even Jesus spoke something about uh, uh, snake worship. Uh, mm, there, is, there is a statement uh, by Jesus about uh, snake worship or a brass, this thing, because in the, in the language of that region, the word uh, snake and the word brass are uh, very similar sounding. So somewhere, uh, I don't know the exact uh, place, but those uh, in America should know this better. The rising of the man is the rising of the snake. This is clearly a yogic statement uh, that the rising of the kundalini is the ultimate rising of the human being because without raising your energy to a higher dimension, uh, the evolution of a human being or thinking that a human being is genuinely changing is a illusory process because whatever changes you make in your attitude and your intentions are purely psychological and they can be washed away in a moment. If you lose your mind, you, you would have lost it. But the raising of the human being is only when the energy, the latent energy which we refer to as kundalini, which is clearly represented as a coiled up snake in the yogic system, it is only in the raising of that, there is a permanent transformation in a human being. This is a statement uh, made by Jesus in the Bible saying that uh, the rising of the snake is the rising of the man or the rising of the man is the rising of the snake. So these are all different things which says the influence of the yogic system goes right back to eighteen, twenty thousand years in terms of archaeological proof and there is really no part of the planet. I think the only place they did not go is uh, North Pole and South Pole. <laughs> Maybe in the Eskimo culture it does not exist, literally everywhere else some influence of this is seen and uh, it has spread across. And all this done without any kind of compulsiveness, without any kind of force, only by showing the significance of uh, what it is. And uh, there are beautiful uh, <coughs> representations of uh, more sophisticated uh, manifestation of yogic culture, particularly in uh, Middle East or uh, West Asia as we call it here. Particularly this particular stone that you're seeing is the Guru Puja stone. When I went to Baalbek, which is uh, part of the Phoenician temple, which was built in… now in Lebanon. When I happened to visit this place about ten years ago, the moment I saw this uh, stone, which is the Guru Puja stone with uh, sixteen offerings, with uh, room for sixteen offerings. 
Even today when we do Guru Puja, it is called as Shoda Shopachara. That means uh, sixteen ways of uh, inviting a guru, sixteen ways of making it happen. This is a, a classic representation of Guru Puja stone. You will find an exact… Uh, exactly similar stone in Uttar Kashi, you will find these stones in… Ka, in Banaras, you will find these stones in southern India, in various temples. The triangle, the manifestation of the <clears throat> stone in… Uh, in the way it is done is geometrically one hundred percent correct. This cannot be done by anybody others, other than somebody who is steeped in uh, yogic sciences. And uh, this must be about four thousand five hundred to five thousand years old in… intact even today in Lebanon. Uh, Lebanese uh, children in their schools uh, study and they know from history that uh, Indian… Indian sculptors, Indian labor, Indian uh, elephants came to work on the Phoenician temples. Uh, if all these people went, if the labor went, the sculptors went and the elephants went, how would the yogis not be there? They would be the forerunners of this whole process. And uh, you will see in Baalbek temple, there's another image uh, of uh, lotuses in the ceiling. Uh, obviously, this is a clear uh, <laughs> uh, Indian uh, art sneaking into Phoenician temple because the sculptors from India, the first thing that they learn is uh, to make a lotus. It's the simplest manifestation of sculpting and they put it in the ceiling of these Phoenician temples almost four thousand to four thousand five hundred to five thousand years ago. Uh, the people in that region would have definitely not seen a lotus because no such thing exists there, but you will see lotuses hanging from the ceiling. This is a lotus inside an Anahata symbol in the ceiling of uh, the Phoenician temple, the sun temple in Lebanon, which is called as Baalbek. This is uh, a fantastic uh, temple, it's a must-see for anybody. If you ever happen to be in that region, it is something that one must see. It is a phenomenal manifestation of human will as to how uh, and the inspiration that is taken from a divine contact, once somebody is touched by something of the beyond, uh, your own uh, earning of the bread or making your own name and fame doesn't arise you want to create something that uh, manifests itself and functions beyond yourself. So these ancient temples are a manifestation of that. You see the symbol, the yogic symbols of Anahata and the blossoming of the flower, it is… it is across the planet in many, many representations uh, in the form of sculpture. Once again, we must remember only that which was carved on stone and that which endured the ravages of time you see but so much of it, which is in practice will never be seen unless like that uh, skeletal representation where someone died in a yogic posture. If that happens only, maybe <laughs> there will be proof of uh, yoga in North America after ten thousand years. So these are all various symbolisms, I will not go into uh, this, this is Jordan. You can see a manifestation of the, the linga forms and the crescent moon and snakes. This is uh, very important, this is a three-headed bull. Before… Uh, the first one uh, is in Sumeria, but we have uh, these things in Indus Valley. Whoever fixes these dates, uh, on what basis, I do not know, we will go by that. And uh, this is about five thousand years where three-headed bull… three-headed bull is a representation of the same uh, uh, process of the Ida, Pingala and the Sushumna, represented as a bull, later on evolved or… Uh, so parallelly it also evolved into three-headed snakes or three snakes, these three-headed bulls and uh, there are wonderful stories going back in many ways, uh, for those of you who are familiar, if you happen to attend uh, 
the Leela program about the way Krishna represented yoga. There's a beautiful story about Krishna taming the bull. There is a whole lot of uh, stories going back into history where this was... Uh, today it is being labeled as uh, bull jumping, where uh, people conquering the bull was uh, not only a uh, macho manifestation in a society, but it was also considered as a spiritual pursuit that if you conquer the bull within you, that means you conquer the, your animal nature, that is when you are delivered. So these two things are very much there in Krishna's life of uh, he taming a bull and then dancing upon the hood of a snake. So these two things are a symbolic uh, representation of how he tamed the animal nature within himself and arrived at a place where he's on top of a, a snake's hood, representing that he's reached. The snake has risen within him, so the man has risen. That is what uh, these two stories are trying to say. Here is a, a beautiful manifestation of uh, a linga and a yogic symbol of seven dimensions of life peeking out and uh, the human figure in between. These are different art forms trying to say the same thing. So this is from the Indus Valley, okay, this is in the Indian region. Here is a two thousand year old uh, Egyptian uh, snake with a crescent on top of it. And <laughs> here what you see is the snake, which is the Lingabhairavi temple. This is uh, the symbol of infinity. They representing infinite nature or cosmic arousal of uh, energy, which is, uh, which is also possible within an individual human being. So this is called as the arborist. Uh, in today's uh, language, uh, this happened uh, a few years ago, I was uh, in conversation with a physicist and <laughs> we had uh, six, seven hours of non-stop uh, unbroken conversation and uh, I was trying to demonstrate to him and uh, if you become meditative or if you get settled in a certain way within yourself, if you hold one's hand uh, uh, let's say uh, nine to twelve inches above my head right now, you can clearly feel the energy moving in this... Uh, in this form. And I said, this is the... this is a dimension which represents you across the physical limitations. If you hold your hand on top of uh, anybody's head, please don't go about experimenting like this <laughs> and proving something about someone else. But uh, you will see the energy will always move this way. The moment it has hit this form, that means he's, class, he's crossed the physical limitations within himself. When I said this, and crossing physical limitations also means moving from finite to infinite. It is on that day that I, uh, <laughs> you know, I logically connected. He said, the, this physicist told me that this is the symbol we use for the uh, expression of the infinite. I said, well, this is... this is from the yogic culture, only someone who has known this within himself could have used that. So the number system, the zero and the infinite, both came from the yogic culture. Today when you say shunya, which is the zero, uh, nobody could have thought of a zero except one who has experienced that uh, sense of emptiness and the vastness of emptiness. When we say emptiness, the word emptiness or nothingness naturally brings psychologically a negative connotation. But emptiness means limitlessness, nothingness means limitlessness, nothingness also means infinite nature. That can only be arrived at experientially, not logically, not by thought, but only by experience. So, it is not uh, an accident that both uh, zero and the infinite comes from the yogic basis and that has become the basis of all modern sciences today. Everything that you do is between uh, zero and infinite, but crossing these two boundaries is what is considered ultimate yoga, because true union happens only when you transcend the numbers. 
Numbers means finite nature. Only when you cross this, there is a, a true union, then only you can say something is in a state of yoga. This is a coil snake. This is a thousand years ago. When you enter uh, Spanda Hall in the yoga center, uh, <laughs> we have a very similar representation. Uh, everybody has to walk over this because Spanda literally means uh, a state of uh, primordial energies. Today the same cultures are uh, very fearful and giving negative images of snakes, but the same cultures at a certain time worshipped snakes and because of a certain campaign, snake has become evil. But even that campaign uh, is not uh, a complete uh, success because it contradicts itself. For example, if you take the story of Adam and Eve, uh, there was a dumb couple who did not know what to do and a snake arrived and it initiated life. Someone who initiates life upon this planet, it's up to you whether you call him the agent of the divine or call him the agent of the devil. If you are for life, you would definitely call him as the agent of the divine. If you are anti-life, then you would call him as the agent uh, of the devil. Here are our beautiful snakes, cascading snakes uh, at the entrance of Janalinga temple. This is the Linga Bhairavi. Someday, maybe uh, <laughs> When I stop uh, traveling around, when I sit down in place, the science behind this, we can experientially manifest for those who are interested as to how uh, all sounds are uh, leading towards this, are rooted in this dimension. That is what the previous image was about. These are South American manifestations of uh, someone trying to build a rudimentary Dhyana Linga <laughs> This is very interesting. Uh, geographically, today in the country that we call as Peru, it's called Chavin. This is a, a classic... Uh, um, yeah, I will be... Uh, <laughs> to... Uh, what to say? <clears throat> It will be too arrogant for me to say it's a classic uh, reproduction of Dhyanalinga site. <laughs> Dhyanalinga is a classic reproduction of this one. We were not aware of this at that time, but now it's really fantastic to see exactly in a similar kind of magnetic and other kind of forces which work on the planet, someone tried to establish uh, a very similar uh, uh, set up of an energy center. This is the plan from the top, but you will see so many things which are very similar. You will see uh, it's very, very similar in construction to the Dhyanalinga complex <coughs> in terms of uh, the plan, the way we uh, did the approaches as to how it should be to make it experientially possible for people who enter the temple. When we built the Analinga, we were not aware of these things, but today people have researched into these things and found out. This is a seven snakes coming out of a human being's head. These are all rep yogic representations of the rising of the Kundalini. This is in South America a few thousand years ago. This is a, an art form of uh, a depiction of uh, somebody using a mudra like this and initiating someone. These are uh, classic images of the Guru Shishya Parampariya in its own form uh, in those cultures. This is a... Uh, I don't know if we can call it a pyramid, it's not a pyramid really. It's somewhere in Central America. So, on the spring equinox, it leaves uh, an image like a coil, I mean, like a snake going up with seven forms of uh, bends 
going up, only on that one day it uh, happens. Uh, the equinox is a tremendous possibility. Uh, in some way, they, the whole effort has been to create forms which will help a human being to attain to his fullest form. So various times of uh, mechanisms were created. Uh, some are very sophisticated, some are rudimentary in nature, but uh, the effort has been there all over the world. So here we are uh, today, uh, uh, seeing the impact of uh, yogic systems across the planet. Whatever these images and stuff we are talking about is only what is left of in form of physical uh, things. But uh, the impact that would have happened, for example, right now, uh, for most of you who are in North America or in United States, for uh, a few thousand people who are doing Isha Yoga, let's say, or a few million people across the world who are doing Isha Yoga. Let's say after ten thousand years, where is the proof that you did yoga? There may, there may be still a few stones left in Dhyanalinga, in case we build something in Tennessee, there may be few stones left there. So somebody will say after ten thousand years, in two different places, Somebody was do… seemed to be doing some yoga, but <laughs> a few millions people are doing and many other millions of people are doing different forms of yoga, all that will not be left. So similarly, when you see one image like this, there must have been a whole population or a generation of people or many generations of people doing this, otherwise the continuity of it for the last twenty thousand years uh, manifesting like this would not happen unless it was an active culture across the world and uh, which has been systematically wiped out in the last couple of thousand years for whatever reasons. There is lore in South America where they are talking about people from another wherever landed there some six, seven thousand years ago and suddenly tribes who were living without any uh, engineering capabilities, their uh, highest level of engineering was a, a, a leather tent, which is called a tepee. From there, suddenly they started building uh, constructions, stone constructions which have even lasted till today, uh, which are masterpieces of engineering. So they say the gods came from elsewhere and taught them this in the lore, this is how it is. I want you to just imagine, six thousand years ago, if somebody came floating on an ocean, on whatever they floated upon, and landed in your land, suppose you were in Indiana and somebody came floating, six thousand years ago when you had not imagined anything beyond the land on which you exist, they definitely would look like gods who came from elsewhere. And uh, they brought in mathematics, they brought in engineering, geometry, and other dimensions, and suddenly those who were living in tents suddenly started building constructions which are… which do not… you cannot… a uh, culture cannot evolve from uh, a rudimentary tent which is just put up with uh, a piece of leather and stick to a sophisticated construction, in just a short span of time, it would take a whole lot of time for people to evolve that, unless an input came from elsewhere. The suggestions that the input came from elsewhere, which uh, you can call it gods or uh, you can say they are Saptarishis or wherever they came from, yes, definitely they came from elsewhere. Everything suggests they could only come from the east and not from anywhere else. So you could assume if you wish, if it… Uh, if it assists uh, your uh, Indian ego, you can say, these people came from India. Not India now, I mean India <laughs> So if it is… Uh, because… Uh, this would be very presumptuous to say, yes, this is Saptarishis, 
but a lot of things indicate it could be them. It would be very presumptuous for anybody to say, yes, this is so, because there is no such thing. But in my experience, within myself, I know these seven sages reached out to the whole world and because that was Adiyogi's intention and that's how they went and there are... there are more, uh, what to say, believable stories. Uh, at the time of Mahabharat, Arjuna decides to... See, we must understand this one thing, that if you go through the Indian lore, if you go as far back as five, six thousand years ago, very clearly they're talking about the planet being round. In fact, even today in the local languages in India, when we say geography, we say bhugol. Bhugol means study of a globe. The very word is suggesting that the earth is round. So, this is not like uh, whatever a few hundred years ago, Galileo invented that... Uh, discovered that uh, earth is round. For thousands of years we've been talking about it. You should see the descriptions in Mahabharata where when Vayu takes uh, Kunti Devi, he takes her across the world yeah. and uh, for the first time she sees and realizes that the planet is round and she talks about it and she couldn't believe that actually you can go round and come back. So they're talking about Vayu as the god of winds who took her around. She realized that the planet is round. There are any number of things to suggest that people were traveling or people did travel to those parts of the world. And also if you go back further, eighteen thousand or twenty thousand BC, uh, during the Ice Age, largely these uh, continents were connected that people could have even walked across, not necessarily gone by... Uh, traveled by the sea, but they could have walked across because land masses were connected one way or the other. So it is possible. If you look at the knowledge that suddenly they exhibited, we can say definitely it is so, but uh, we don't have exact proof to say it is so.